All right, let's see what we've been playing. Oh, that's unexpected. Huh. Guess I should talk about this. I've put more hours into Ultimate Alliance 3 than I have any other game on my Switch. More than Zelda, more than Animal Crossing. And as such, I'm now going to talk about this game more than any other person ever has. Right then, let's review this beast. The story of Ultimate Alliance 3 is bare bones. It plays a lot like the best of collection of the Marvel movies as well as some of the best comic stories. There isn't, strictly speaking, a main character. As such, there's absolutely no character depth or growth. In fact, there's very little information about any of these characters. So if you don't know who Crystal is, or Elsa Bloodstone, or Ghost Rider, there's no real way to learn who they are here. Most characters get an introduction that showcases their power set, but outside of that, there's nothing. It makes me miss the old trivia games that were present in the X-Men Legends and the original Ultimate Alliance games. It wasn't much, but at least it gave us trivia. We meet the Guardians of the Galaxy, as they ruin a plan by Ronan the Accuser and Nebula to lure in Thanos with the actual set of full Infinity Stones. And their plan, as far as I can tell, is that they're just going to attack him. Their motivation for doing this? The location of the stones before now? How Nebula and Ronan have joined forces? The game does not elaborate. And that lack of plot detail follows the entire story of coincidences and cameos through the entirety of the game. But I'm not holding this against the game. It didn't set out to be a great story with moving characters and emotion and character depth. It set out to be a light co-op action RPG, the kind of couch co-op game that consoles just don't do anymore. And the story should reflect that as being light and fun and not drag down the proceedings. And in that regard, Ultimate Alliance 3 mostly succeeds. There's a metric ton of characters, over 90 counting NPCs and boss fights. We travel from Kree Space to the Raft to Hell's Kitchen, Avengers Tower, the X-Mansion, the Dark Dimension, the Realm of Hell, Asgard, the friggin' Moon, and nowhere. Where it stumbles is being light fun. First off, due to the mechanics of the game, the early parts of it are quite horrible. Let's talk about the combat mechanics. Regular attacks, such as light and heavy attacks, generate energy. Energy is then used to attack with abilities. If two compatible abilities strike the same enemy or area, it becomes a synergy attack. With the exception of a handful of characters, abilities are quite underwhelming. And light and heavy attacks are only good at building energy, not damaging or taking out foes. That leaves synergies as the big damage dealing option for players. This is largely unsatisfying, especially early on. Early game you have only one ability per character, meaning it'll take a lot of grinding to get any given character to a point where you can use their best synergies. Also, low level characters have an anemic energy bar, so you'll often be wailing with weak basic attacks, just waiting for the energy to do synergies again. Mobs can take forever and some of the arenas you'll be battling these mobs in leave a lot to be desired. The Dark Dimension was the first chapter that was an honest slog for me because of the game's leveling mechanic. Only the active four characters in your party gain experience. The rest of the roster stays in a stasis. And every chapter has you meet new characters and add them to your roster but they're not leveled towards your party's level, or even towards the level of difficulty of the chapter that they're introduced in, meaning new characters are usually useless without grinding for a few levels first. And the game's difficulty quickly outpaces your level, requiring even the highest level characters you have to occasionally have to replay chapters or run infinity rifts to gain further levels. In this game made for light and fun action, with drop-in and out couch co-op, it's not really possible to go through the game changing your playable characters whenever you want. You have to grind them. And so, in my original playthrough with Mike, this chapter dragged on. We had changed the team, being tired of playing as Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, and the Hulk the entire game, to Scarlet Witch, who seemed important to the story at this point, Ghost Rider, who was just added, 
Elsa Bloodstone, because she was new and also just added. And we kept Captain America, because Cap's awesome. Deaths were frequent. Bosses and mobs took forever. By the end of the Dark Dimension, we almost gave up playing the game as a co-op oh, game. commanded by the dread Dormammu. And later, Wakanda actually took Mike out of the game. Again, we'd switch characters to those that seemed important to the story and setting to disastrous results. Wakanda is also a great example of the game's artificial difficulty spikes. In this case, by adding two new enemy types. We got these big bulky tank guys who obscure the battlefield with their green gas. And your characters in that gas take damage over time, slow down, and sometimes get stun locked where they can't move or attack. They also just turn an already kind of hectic screen into an even busier screen, making it easier than ever to lose your character in the noise, especially in co-op. And then there's the snipers. My characters in this footage are in their hundreds as far as levels are concerned, and Wakanda was not made for anything over level 100 to exist. But even with these highly over-leveled characters, look at how much damage I take from one sniper shot. They hit harder than Thanos. These snipers can easily one-shot a character in your first playthrough. And this area, with a stupid big cannon firing every two seconds, narrow hiding spots and multiple snipers, this area wiped us so much that Mike quit the game. And sadly, the mission got much easier without him. This area was not made for couch co-op. You need to run your single character up the ramp, avoiding as many enemies and explosions as you can. Having a friend shackling the camera between your two positions only made this worse. That all said, I gotta tell you about the high point of the entire game. The X-Mansion chapter. Comrade, heads up! And eyes wide open! My god, look at these 90s Jim Lee inspired characters. Look at the mansion! It's a physical location you can understand in three dimensions. And the enemies? They're all sentinels, baby! These are my personal favorite enemies in the entire game. They're limited in numbers so that you don't get 20 or 30 of them thrown at you at once. Their attacks are all very readable, allowing you to predict and counter their moves. They even have a gimmick where the power source of one sentinel can be thrown to do high damage and stun another sentinel, so you build momentum through each battle. The characters here are fun and iconic. They all get to say their little Chris Claremont catchphrases, and, I mean, look at this screen. Look at all these X-Men. Isn't that the coolest? Christ, I wish we had a good X-Men game right now. And then we get attacked by Magneto, Mystique, and the goddamn Juggernaut. Fight them all at once. Get chased by the Juggernaut, defeat the Juggernaut, and let Colossus teach him some manners. Jesus is the best part of the game. Mike and I had smiles through the whole chapter. Oh yeah, and it's Taco Tuesday. The Gameplay I've spoken some on the gameplay already. It's a simple button mashing RPG. Each character has their own stats, but that information on these stats like strength, mastery, and the rest are so vague that it's hard to tell what's good or bad. For the most part, it seems like stats don't matter, except for early on when having more health or energy can greatly alter your enjoyment of the game. 
Each character also has four abilities. Most of these abilities can synergize with others. And while there are definitely good and bad synergies, every synergy is better than any ability or attack. Enemies come in large mobs, full of mooks and elites. Elites can use their own abilities and tend to pop your character in the air or on the ground. Elites and bosses also have purple stagger bars under their health. Depleting these stagger bars causes the enemy to momentarily stop attacking or moving. While staggered, a synergy can stun the enemy, prolonging its time of vulnerability. Certain characters and certain abilities deal extra damage to stagger bars than others. Characters like Black Panther and Wolverine are particularly good at spamming abilities that melt stagger bars. These boss killer characters are far from required, but they do help. Synergies are your bread and butter when it comes to damage, and a handful of characters, such as Miles Morales, Star-Lord, and Doctor Doom, can even set up and detonate their own synergies by themselves. These self-synergy characters, as fans have named them, are rather good additions to any team composition. Most of your time in this game will be spent grinding, which means you're going to spend time in Infinity Rifts. Infinity Rifts are challenge rooms. Sometimes you're meant to survive for a set amount of time, or defeat a certain enemy or number of enemies, or you fight multiple boss enemies at once. Completing Rifts rewards you with new skins, and sometimes whole characters like Cyclops and Elektra. It also gives out XP cubes, which are great at leveling lower level characters, and it gives out ISO 8s. And here we get into the major flaw of the game, even worse than the endless grind. ISO 8s. ISO 8s are crystals that you randomly collect by defeating enemies or busting up crates. They can also be added just through normal gameplay, like beating certain objectives or rifts. Any ISO 8 can then be added to a character, who at first can hold any two ISO 8s, but eventually, through leveling up, can hold five. Most ISO 8s are nothing special. They modify a character's stats, which again are mostly useless. But some can add elemental damage, increase status effects, or allow your character to recover health per damage, which is one of my favorites. A few of them can even make it harder for characters to be knocked up in the air or knocked down. One increases team XP gain. Another type makes the enemy AI target the holder more than others, allowing for tanking in the game. But these ISO 8s are the minority. Most of these crystals, which you cannot avoid picking up, are just trash. This is by design, as you're supposed to break down unwanted ISO 8s into their base components, and use that to level up your good ISO 8s. But you almost never need to level them. The ISO 8s that really benefit from leveling up, like the XP gain ones, are few and far between. Others, you'll likely find a higher quality ISO 8 that does the exact same thing. And the cost of upgrading is really hefty. Not merely in ISO 8 fragments, but you'll also have to sacrifice a small number of similar colored ISO 8s and a small fortune of credits. Oh yes, despite having no microtransactions, which thank god, this game has an enormous amount of currencies. We have ISO 8s, ISO 8 fragments, credits, Shield tokens, which are only used at the Shield Depot. AP, which is used to level up your characters. Ability orbs, which are also used to level up your character abilities. And no, I don't understand why we have two currencies to level up Iron Fist's punch. Enhancement points, which are used in the Alliance Enhancement Lab to provide passives. And Void Spears, which you use to respec a character or ability. Probably, I've never used one once. There are eight different currencies and they just don't do enough different things to justify their inclusion. Lastly, with ISO 8s, there's an indestructible ISO 8 type. At certain points in the story, or at specific challenge rewards, you get indestructible ISOs, which cannot be broken down or modified. And if that was all there was, it would be annoying, but that would be fine. These indestructible crystals, however, can pop up at random and the game only allows you to have a thousand ISO 8s at a time. Once you reach that, you're locked out of events, challenges, and other things as your inventory is too full to continue playing. This puts a timer on your game. One day, with enough playing, you will hit 1000 unbreakable ISO 8s, and you will be locked out of further play. 
and while the hours you'll need to reach this are astronomical, it is theoretically possible. Hell, look at how much time I've put into this game. This has never been addressed by Team Ninja, the developers. So, once you reach 1000 ISOs, you gotta break them down. This is a chore. And at this point, I just break down without even looking at what the ISO 8s even do. Have I undoubtedly missed a great ISO doing this? Yeah, probably. But again, even the best ISOs aren't game changing. So I don't feel like I'm missing anything versus min-maxing numbers that barely affect the gameplay. So, to summarize, ISO 8s are tedious. Managing them slows down the game. The screen that upgrades ISOs can't be used to equip them and vice versa, forcing you to go between two separate load screens or more if you need to bring the character in question into your party. The effects of ISOs are minimal on gameplay, and their existence necessitated three out of the eight currencies in the game. Without hyperbole, I can say this game would be better without ISO 8s than with. Even if I do like the idea of a gear system to modify and customize the characters, I don't think they're worth this trouble. And the goal here was never customization of the characters anyway. If that was the goal, it would have been much better reached by creating alternate abilities rather than just the four. Alternate abilities would allow for different character builds and character expression, such as perhaps you prefer a Captain America that was a tank, a support character who gives team boost and defends with a shield, but perhaps your friend prefers Captain America as a DPS damager. No, the reason ISO 8s and the other currencies exist is the same reason why inactive characters do not gain experience with the active team. It's the same reason characters unlock lower leveled than the chapters that they appear in. It's the same reason the difficulty spikes so high. It's just to prolong the game's runtime. It's just there to ensure that you grind. And the purpose of that grind is just to unlock everything you can. Every skin, every character, every ability. And once you have, there's nothing else to do in the game. DLC. Now then, we have three DLCs that are not sold separately, but did come out slowly over the course of a year. And while I go through each one individually, I'll start by saying these DLC pretty much created as much in-game content as the game could support. The rewards were not always worth it, but they did add new game modes, which gave meaning to some of the grind. I'll say they went overboard with increasing the level cap from originally 100 to 300, especially since they added no new abilities to the characters that high level, but I digress. A new Infinity Rift was added soon after the game released, for free for all players. It offered the toughest challenge to the game at that time, including new costumes for Hulk, Spider-Man, and Captain Marvel. It also gave us Cyclops and Colossus, both characters who were the absolute best in their categories of beam range character and tank. They were tough to unlock and exceedingly worthwhile. The first paid DLC was Curse of the Vampire. It added Punisher, Blade, Moon Knight, and Morbius, the living vampire, to the game. Each character had their own gimmicks. Punisher had a heavy attack that felt better to spam than his light attack, plus he could snipe across the map. Blade could alter his abilities by holding them down and charging them. Moon Knight was probably the master of melee and is still the fastest traversal option in the game with his glide ability. And finally, we have Morbius, the best character added with this DLC. Morbius plays a lot like a slightly weaker Black Panther and Wolverine, a single target assassin. Perfect for fighting bosses and elites, but Morbius can paralyze mobs with his hypnotic gaze. Anything elite or above will resist the paralyze, but will instead take a debuff where damage to them is increased. This meant that Morbius was the second ever character in the game to have a debuff. And while it's not much, it did mean Morbius had a bit more to him than any of the other characters, and I liked that. With Curse of the Vampire came two new modes. The first was called Nightmare Mode. In Nightmare Mode, you replay the original story mode, 
but now elites have auras that can drain health or buff mooks or debuff the player character. Nothing else changed with Nightmare, and the entire reason to do it was to grind out the new currency, Shield Tokens. The other mode was the Gauntlet. The Gauntlet loosely told a story of vampires attacking the multiverse, but it's so half-baked it's not worth talking about. In a Gauntlet, you go through a series of challenge rooms, each step involving new parameters and objectives, such as light and heavy attacks will do less damage, or your health is constantly draining. You complete one step and then go on to the next, all with a set number of lives. Once you run out of lives, your gauntlet run was over. For this DLC, the gauntlet was a touch unimaginative. A lot of the same objectives over and over again. But with each subsequent DLC, they would add their own gauntlets, and each time, Team Ninja did get better at it. To the point that I actually really enjoyed the Shadow of Doom gauntlet. But there were two problems with the gauntlets that were never addressed. One is the first time you clear all the steps of a gauntlet, it kicks you out immediately. But there are secondary and tertiary objectives to gauntlets, which have a specific reward attached to them. These objectives and these rewards require multiple passes through the gauntlet. This kickout never stops to being an annoyance, especially since there's now so many gauntlets to run across the three DLCs. The other issue is just how poorly optimized the game has always been. Load times for the game are long. In story mode, you could watch cinematics that played while the game loaded. And in Infinity Rifts, you could immediately replay a rift after beating it. Here, however, each step of the gauntlet takes forever to load. So a mode that should feel energetic and tense as you go through a gauntlet of challenges and enemies with limited lives feels very slow. Tension evaporates instantly as you're shown a victory screen and then 45 seconds of loading for the next small arena with only a handful of enemies in it. Overall, I enjoyed the idea of gauntlets in this DLC, but not as they were presented here. I did not care at all for Nightmare Mode as it was just a grind for a new currency I didn't need. And the new characters were mostly fine. Moon Knight and Morbius were great additions. Blade was okay, and the Punisher isn't the worst character in the game, but he might be the worst ranged character in the game. If it was sold separately, as a DLC, I would recommend this only to people who loved the new characters added, or just wanted more Ultimate Alliance 3, as that's all this really is. The second DLC was Rise of the Phoenix. It brought in four new X-Men characters. They seem like rather strange additions, personally. But there's of course the Phoenix, Jean Grey, then there's her stepson Cable, then Iceman, and then fan favorite Gambit. It's a weird mix. Not the characters I would have picked. For your information, I would have either doubled down on the 90s X-Men cartoon and added Rogue, Gambit, Jubilee, and Jean, or doubled down on the Dark Phoenix era and got Kitty Pride, Dazzler, Emma Frost, and Jean. Still, these characters were all great additions. Let's start with Iceman, who buffs the whole team, has an extremely high chance for his attacks to freeze enemies, and can do crowd control. His Frost Beam is particularly great at killing bosses. Gambit also has crowd control. His dangerous ground ability allows him to place two large circles on the ground which continuously damage and slow enemies. Luck of the Draw allows him to place explosive cards all over the battlefield, then detonate them with a kinetic burst ability, his heavy attack, or his air attack. It's great at clearing mobs, and you're capable of dealing some incredible damage. Gambit being a trap guy wouldn't exactly have been my call, but he does add a lot of variety to the game. Speaking of variety, we have Cable. Cable again gives us crowd control with his gravity bomb ability that pulls all nearby enemies into a circle, perfectly setting them up for Gambit or Cable's own follow-ups. While it's a bit more involved than others, Cable can also set up his own self-synergy. It requires him using three of his four abilities and the player being fast enough to pull it off, but it's still something you can do. And finally, we have Jean Grey herself. She's the closest thing to an essential character in this game due to her extreme attack and Cleansing Flame. Cleansing Flames is a damage over time area of effects spell that converts all damage into energy for the entire party. Since synergies are your bread and butter in the game, being allowed to switch to Gene, drop some flames, then switch back and cause mayhem, all while regenerating copious amounts of energy is... perfecto. This ability is never not useful. Any team composition you run is going to need energy, and Gene is the team's giant battery. 
Her extreme attack is not only easy to aim, which is an issue for some characters like Iron Man, but it also revives a downed party member. And for a while afterwards, Jean has a circle around her feet that indicates that if she dies with that circle, she'll be revived at full health. If there were tier rankings for characters in this game, Jean Grey would be the only S tier. As for game modes, this DLC came with its own gauntlet, which was fine, I preferred it over the Curse of the Vampire gauntlet, and a new mode that was called the Danger Room. The Danger Room was an ambitious addition. This was a competitive multiplayer mode. Players would form up two teams and go through a small gauntlet of three challenge rooms. During these challenge rooms, many challenges, such as dodge X amount of times, would show up on the right hand screen. Completing these mini challenges would send a disadvantage to your opponent. Some are minor, like spawning an orb that damages all characters near it, while others can paralyze the entire team, which often led to a team wipe if you were busy fighting loads of opponents. These disadvantages can be game changers, and as such, there's always a bit of tension in Danger Room matches. You can play competitively online or locally, and you can play against the AI if you do not wish to fight people, which is what I do during this recording. There are multiple levels of difficulty to the Danger Room. There's Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, and Omega difficulties. These are set at certain character levels. For example, Alpha is set at level 25. So if you bring a level 150 Nightcrawler and a level 60 Wolverine into the Danger Room, they'll both be reduced to level 25 for the session. Conversely, Epsilon is set at level 200, so both Nightcrawler and Wolverine would be raised to level 200 for the Danger Room session. For this reason, the characters do not gain any experience points directly from the Danger Room. Indirectly, they can earn XP cubes, and you can use those as you wish. Conceptually, this is a great idea, and it fills in the void of a proper endgame. But again, we have horrendous load times, made all the worse here because sometimes you're waiting on other players to launch their game. Another problem is that there's three rounds, so you would think it would be the best of three, or sometimes best of four, as occasionally Dark Phoenix attacks as a round four surprise. It isn't. If Red Team wins the first two rounds, there's not only still a third round, but that third round is winner takes all. Hypothetically, your team could win all three rounds, get attacked by the Phoenix, fail to defeat her first, and lose the entire Danger Room session. The Danger Room was, frankly, a pretty great idea for the game, and I had a lot of fun with it, but the way it determined winners and its lengthy load times took a lot of wind out of its sails. The final thing added with this DLC was monthly challenges. The first challenge was tied to the Danger Room and awarded ISO 8s, character costumes, character voice lines, XP cubes, and even concept art. Challenges usually aren't too hard, and the awards are most often XP cubes and credits, which actually really helps the grind. I've gotten quite a few levels out of these cubes to characters who I do not enjoy playing, such as Rocket and Groot. Overall, Rise of the Phoenix was a significant improvement over Curse of the Vampire. Its additions, while flawed, were welcomed. I recommend it easily if it were sold separately. Ah, so glad you came, heroes. Annihilus has millions of mouths to feed. The third and final DLC was Shadow of Doom, and it added everyone you think it would. Mr. Fantastic, the Invisible Woman, Human Torch, The Thing, and the incomparable Doctor Doom. Mr. Fantastic is a DPS machine, long-range melee, great traversal, very spammable air attack. The Invisible Woman has two standout abilities. First, she has a telekinetic bubble rapid fire attack, which does moderate damage, but also has a high chance to encase an enemy from the lowest mook to even the highest bosses like Thanos in a telekinetic bubble. These enemies are interrupted regardless of their stagger bar, and it's great fun to use. The second ability is her team buff, which is supposed to reduce all incoming range attack damage by roughly 75%. However, due to a glitch, this 75% reduction of damage is not limited to range attacks, and instead applies to all attacks. 
So having Sue keep this buff up reduces all damage taken by 75%. This is incredible for gauntlets and story chapters with characters who are underleveled. The Human Torch is one of the few characters in the game whose ability damage is roughly on par with his synergy damage. He's a load of fun. The Thing might be the best tank in the game. I still personally believe that Colossus is the best, but stat-wise, the Thing clobbers Colossus. And he has one ability that makes him invulnerable for as long as you hold it down. This ability will be talked about more later. Finally, we have Doctor Doom, who's the game's only self-synergy summoner. He's able to summon a Doom Bot, which provides damage over time to an area. Then the Doom Bot will mirror any other ability power that Doom casts, creating three self synergies. Doom isn't quite as overpowered as Phoenix is, but he might be my favorite character to play as. There's also two added gameplay modes here. The first is my favorite gauntlet. It's not that it's more creative than the other gauntlets, but it's far more focused on boss rushes, which I find to be much funner than just taking out mooks. The second mode is an actual story mode. They said it wasn't gonna happen, but I kept the faith, and here we are, rocking some sweet DLC action. This added an epilogue to the game, giving an in-story explanation for why the Fantastic Four sat out the original game. Turns out Doom trapped them in the negative zone, and now the FF need to survive and outwit Annihilus. So we need to show up, rescue the Fantastic Four, then come back and defeat Doctor Doom, who is threatening the entire world with his theft and use of the Soul Stone. It's simple. We get to see new locations, we get to fight new enemies and new bosses, unlock five new characters and their alternate costumes. It's fun. But the star of this story, which blows away the main game, is the focus on character. Whereas the vanilla game had no main characters, here it's all about the Fantastic Four. The group gets to talk and joke and reference things to each other the entire game. We also get appearances from other DLC characters like Moon Knight, Punisher, Cable, and Gambit who had no scenes in the original game as they had not been introduced yet. And for the most part, this epilogue is fun. There are too many enemies sometimes, forcing us to stand in place and defeat multiple waves of beefy enemies. That's not too fun, but it's also not too damning either. The worst thing about the story, however, is this bit. There are three of these corridors where you have to charge towards the Celestial attacking you. Each time you have to do it, it throws more attacks and status effects at you. This is from the final run, and it is tough. But the thing trivializes this frustrating mess. His ability that allows him to move and be invulnerable for as long as you have energy, that ability is so useful here that I suspect the encounter was meant for the thing specifically. But despite the epilogue's focus on the Fantastic Four, you are not required to bring them. So it's very possible the player doesn't have the thing in their party, or were aware of the thing's ability, and this would just be three very frustrating corridors. It's worth noting Colossus has a similar ability, but he walks at half speed while using his ability. The thing suffers no movement speed loss. This is the biggest and most glaring problem of the epilogue. Otherwise, this is, well, a fantastic close to the game's DLCs. And I'm glad the Fantastic Four got to be included in the game in some capacity. I'd easily recommend this DLC had it been sold separately. So, where do I stand with this game and its DLC? And why, dear God, did I put so many hours into this? I think Ultimate Alliance fills a really niche spot in my gaming. I almost never played it at home, I mostly played it at work. At work I would get two 15 minute breaks and a 30, and for those 15 minutes I could run a rift or grind a gauntlet. The absurd level cap and the copious currencies meant that even a short 15 minutes of play meant that I'd accomplished something. In this respect, I played Ultimate Alliance much like I would a $60 mobile game. Each time I played, I leveled up, got new ISOs, or got shield tokens that I could use to buy XP cubes. It always rewarded me with pleasing endorphins as my brain was fooled into thinking I was progressing towards something. But once I got home, I had better games or activities to occupy my time. I would go so far to say that as it currently is, this game would be dog shit on the Xbox, PlayStation, or PC. 
the sheer amount of grinding and the low effort rewards would sink the game. But the mobility of the Switch made this more palatable, at least to me. I could pull it out in a waiting room, bus stop, or break room and play, and just as easily turn it off. As a couch co-op game, fighting the camera isn't fun. Pulling off synergies with another player is so much harder than with the AI, which will always prioritize doing synergies with you. More importantly, while few characters are always viable, like Thor, many take hours of grinding before they open up, and grinding rifts with friends is pretty tedious. This is a rough game to start. It is punishingly hard until you outlevel any of the challenge. I feel most characters only open up gameplay-wise at around level 100. There they have good stats and they have all of their abilities maxed out. I just wish that the characters felt as good to play at level 25 as they do at level 100. And even after 250 plus hours playing, I still have 7 characters who were under level 100. So that should tell you all you need to know about the time required to grind these 52 characters. This game is fairly average, and the DLC pack adds more to the game, but with the caveat that it is more of the same game. Team Ninja seems really good at iterative improvements with this game, and I hope that means an Ultimate Alliance 4 would be a solid step up, because I do want another game in this series. One that's less grindy, with fewer currencies, with crowd control, buffs, debuffs, all present from launch and not added with DLC characters later. One that matches the fun spirit of the X-Mansion and the Fantastic Four chapters of the game. And I think Team Ninja might be able to pull this off. As long as they build on what worked here, Ultimate Alliance 4 could be rather special. Or at least, I hope so. Thanks for watching.